Hi everybody, Quint Lears with NewHomeSales.com. I'm here with rising star, new home trainer, legend, Jason Forrest. It was hard to actually get him in as an interview because so many people were coming up and wanting to talk to you. Appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. You are here, we're here at the Sales Central and the International Builder Show 2016. Jason, you got some exciting stuff coming up. Tell me about this new program, Stump the Chump. Uh, yeah, so, so we're about to um, have uh, gosh, I don't know, two, 300 people here and they can ask any question they want to ask me that has to do with how to sell a house. So uh, whatever struggle, I mean, the, the question should always be, I could sell more houses if whatever. Um, and so whatever people want to say, whatever people want to ask, that's keeping them from giving themselves a pay raise, keeping them from selling more in 2016, you know, off the cuff, completely improv style, they can ask me. So I might do well or I might fall on my face. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm excited to, to handle the challenge. I have a feeling you're going to do very, very well. Look, the mindset. So, I mean, we, obviously we can't maybe memorize tens of thousands of different objections, but what's the mindset that you have in going into this? Uh, when it comes to handling objections or for me? Handling objections, because that's a big fear and challenge of salespeople. Oh my God, what are they going to ask? So the fear, I guess, of uncertainty in our business. What, what, what do I have to do to prepare for that? Teach me. Sure, perfect. Well, first off, I mean, what you'll, no what you'll notice is that that it's very rare that you'll actually hear an objection that you haven't heard before. So there's always some sort of like pattern that has to do with the objection. Um, and so once you kind of, you know, you, wherever, wherever you're going across the world, there's the same reasons why people aren't buying. So it's uh, both decision makers aren't present or, you know, they haven't sold their house yet or uh, the, they don't like the lot, they don't like the area, they don't like the community, uh, they don't like the floor plan. I mean, there's some, you know, your, your builders' uh, um, homes are $20,000 more expensive than the person next door, so they don't understand the value. I mean, there's some reason that's keeping, from, keeping a person that's, you know, from buying and giving them uncertainty. But once you kind of realize the pattern of all of it, then it's pretty easy. I mean, you, you kind of control the pattern. That's that's basically the, the simple secret behind it. So we'll see if it works. We'll see if it works. So people are going to ask me all these questions and we'll see if it works. Jason, um, you're, you're an accomplished author. The book Urgency, I've read that book. It's actually helped me in my personal career and thank you for that. Um, 40 Day Sales Dare, the sales leadership book the, for sales managers. You have a new book. Tell me about that. Sure. So, so the, the, you know, the last book I wrote was called Leadership Sales Coaching, Transforming from Manager to a Coach. And I took this premise that a salesperson is an, is a athlete and they should be coached like an athlete, not managed like an employee. And I was really fr kind of frustrated, kind of like when I was, when I wrote the book Critical Urgency that all these sales managers out there, you know, they, they truly want to, to um, help their salespeople be, perform at a higher level. They just don't know what to do. And so if you look at all the trainers out there, everyone always says, hey, sales manager, get out in the field, coach your people, uh, you know, hold them accountable, teach them how to perform at a higher level, but no one actually knows what to do. And so I took this premise that, well, what if Nick Saban was running your sales team? You know, what if Pete Carroll was running, what if, what if the greatest uh, sales coach, the greatest coaches out there are running your sales team, how would they do things differently? What would they say to, to turn them into sales gladiators, turn them into these world-class sales athletes. And so I wrote this book that uh, has now won several awards, and it's the only book out there that gives sales managers very specific uh, um, uh, principles and tactics and strategies on how to uh, give their salespeople pay raises. So it's real simple. Uh, the, the book that I'm writing right now, it's actually uh, coming out in the first quarter of 2016, and it's, it's co-written by Paul with Paul Cardis of Avid. And so Avid is the... Uh, the market leader in customer satisfaction surveys in home building in North America and Canada and the US. And so what I, what I decided to do was I wanted to write a book um, on customer service, which is really funny because um, I've always said I'm not a customer service guy, I'm a sales trainer and I focus on sales and leadership and culture. But as we all know, um, if you increase your sales, a lot of times you also increase your cancellations because you increase buyer's remorse and you know this whole philosophy. And so what I wanted to do is write the first book that was was um, was was kind of change the way you look at customer service in the sense that don't look at it from a customer service perspective. Look at it from a sales perspective, and and how do we write this book? So I wrote the book as if if when I was a top salesperson uh, in new home sales, what would I be okay with hearing that wasn't soft, that wasn't fluffy, that was something that you know that I could really relate to. And so the book is called Service Certainty: The Secret to Customer Loyalty. And what's great about the whole thing is that for the first time, the book is actually backed up by research. So it's all the avid, all the avid customer satisfaction research that they use to make sure that customers are loyal. And 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 the goal of the whole book, and this is a question we should all ask ourselves: is how do we get our customers to be truly addicted to us? You know, you think about addictions. Most people think of addictions as, you know, I got some drug addiction or some bad addiction. But to me, the, the difference between a good addiction and a bad addiction is, is does it give me uh, myself, does it give me, myself and my family harm or joy? But if you think about it, we're addicted to a lot of brands. 
And the question is, what if you could make your customers addicted to you, addicted to your process, addicted to your brand? You know, they pay more for it? Well, of course they would. I mean, you pay more for Apple, you pay more for all these different products that that they seem very similar to the product next door, but you're addicted to the concept. And so what I wanted to do is, is kind of unravel, and again, just take a totally different look on this, on this concept. Very simple, it's 15 uh, best practices on how to give your customer certainty so that they're, uh, so you create an unbelievable brand. You create a brand that they want to spend time with you versus they have to spend time with you. And so a simple, a simple concept right now that, that I talk about in the book that is just, to me, kind of change the game concept is that, is that in home building, we try to create what I call unfireable brands, not unleavable brands. An unfireable brand is, is I'm gonna take so much earnest money deposit from you, and I'm gonna uh, spend so much time locking you into this product, where I golden handcuff you into having to buy a home for me, not you want to buy a home for me. You, you're stuck with me, no matter what, you're stuck with me. And think about how many customers that I've spoken to, and you've probably spoken to in your career, that they go, I would, leave, I, would, I, would get, I would have canceled by now, but it's gonna cost me too much money to cancel. Well, think about, think about what they're gonna say to all of their friends and family, they're gonna say to Facebook, they're gonna say to the universe on, I would not buy this home, however, I couldn't get out of it. It was an unfireable situation. And so my, it's crazy, isn't it? So my whole thing is, what if you change the whole paradigm and you said, how do I create an unleavable brand, unleavable relationship where, where, where they don't feel like they're stuck with me? You know, they truly want to be with me. So even in our own company, at Forest Performance Group, Forest PG, the tagline we use is called Human Performance Unleashed. If we started a thing 10 years ago, we still do it, that all of our contracts are month to month. And, and, and all of our clients, they're, 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 we have publicly traded companies that we're month to month with, huge accounts. And, and, they always, and, and it's funny because I'll tell them, I said, look, I don't want you to ever feel behind my back that I would get out of this contract because the training is not doing anything for our company, but we're stuck with you for six months. I don't want to deal with that. I have a reputation to uphold. And so every single month, I want to give your, your company profitability increases and your salespeople pay raises. And if I'm not doing that, I want to be fired. You know what I mean? So, so that's the whole idea, the premise behind, uh, to me, creating a great brand experience, creating a great culture, creating a great you know, customer experience. I mean, how do we really do that? How do we create you know, that service certainty? And when certainty is lost, all is lost. And, and Jason, you talked about building a reputation. Some things you may not know about Jason, he's the real deal, um, frontline sales executive. Um, tell me about the person who was your Sunday school teacher, somebody very special, legend, um, and also your first sale was someone you were very, very young age. I wanna hear about that. Yeah, so, um, so when I was a kid, my, my father owns, uh, to this, still to this day, he owns the oldest jewelry store in Dallas. And so since I was you know, a little kid, I learned how to sell emotional, the emotional sell through my father. Because if you think about it, um, when, you look at the, when you look at a diamond, you know, the, a human being cannot tell the difference between a $3,000 diamond and a $15,000 one carat diamond without proper education and proper equipment. And I mean education, I mean like three years of gemology school and like a loop. And so most human beings, uh, it's the question I always ask myself is, well, why is someone spending five times more for something they can't even see? Well, it's because of the emotional connection. It's because there's something about that diamond that makes them feel significant, it makes them feel certain, makes them feel love. You know, there's something about it that, that, that gives them that thrill. And, and so I learned at a very young age how to tap into that from my father and how to create this unleavable brand type experience. Well, my dad's addicted to sales, just like I'm addicted to sales, and I'm sure you are too. And, and so he put me in um, Zig Ziglar Sunday school t class in Plano, Texas, which is crazy. And so, crazy. I, I know. So every Sunday, you know, he would, it was awesome. It was just very, I mean, it's funny because it's one of those things where you don't really know what you don't know. And so I didn't really appreciate who I was being taught by every Sunday until, you know, college, even, even thereafter. I just knew he was some really motivating guy, but I didn't really know who he was. Um, I knew the concept of him, but I didn't really appreciate, I didn't really revere and respect him until later on. Does that make sense? Yeah. But. But the guy was, you know, obviously Zig's a legend and, and uh, you know, is the father of, of professional sales training, so. Well, you heard it. So Zig Ziglar was his Sunday school teacher. Obviously it rubbed off. I'm hoping that it rubs off on me. Yeah. Uh, I've been following Jason since he uh, kind of first started and you know, I was in sales and you started in the training. It's been a huge encouragement to me. I know you're national, so you do national consulting training. How do I, inter I'm sorry, international. How do I contact you? If there's a builder, there's a salesperson, um, do you have daily motivation? How can they connect with you? Um, what, do I, what do I do? Yeah, sure. So, so you just go to forestpg.com. Uh, so P for performance, uh, G for group. Uh, so forest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T, pg.com. And then right there, there's a, uh, a newsletter subscription. And we send out um, 
uh, really X Factor strategies on how to be you know the top professional you can be. Of course, go to our Facebook page, Twitter, all that great stuff to to connect to us and, and figure out what we're doing. But I will tell you, <clears throat> you know, the biggest thing that you want to ask yourself whenever you subscribe to a, a sales trainer or or even any kind of coach in your life is you have to ask yourself, um, is this person a street level? sales professional. So if you're going to be taught by someone, you don't want a false prophet. You don't want some guy that's taught this stuff um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, in a college career, but has never been successful doing it. And so the only thing I would just say is, you know, really seek out, I mean, one, you got to have coaching. Because I believe that our beliefs in life have more to do with our success than our abilities, but the coaching along the way makes all the difference. So you've got to be obsessed over finding the best coaches. But, but once you, once you uh, um, uh, but really, really make sure that they're not just all hat, no cattle. They're not just some false prophet that, because they can really lead you the wrong way. So that's the, that's the only thing I would say, but definitely find the coaches and then find the best ones. One last question. Um, your enthusiasm's contagious. I, you, I'm getting excited just right now in our talking. Give me some advice for the frontline salesperson that's watching this, that's discouraged, that maybe had a cancellation. First of all, how do you keep doing it? Why do you keep doing it? And what can you communicate to that salesperson who's feeling discouraged right now? Yeah, perfect. So, so if you think it just kind of, kind of peel back the onion of, of ask yourself why. So why did you originally get in this career and every single commission-based salesperson I've ever talked to on the planet, now we're in banking, we're in retail, we're in furniture sales, we're in, uh, we have the number one Rolls, Rolls Rolex dealership in the world that we train, number two car dealership in the, in the US that we train out of 17,000 car dealerships. And they all tell me the same thing. They all do it to make what I call worth it money. Worth it money is, it's, it's, it's the amount of money that I need to make to make uh, the uh, make it worth it, make the sacrifices worth it. So if you think about it, when you let when you left your nine to five job, maybe you're making forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. Well, you said that's not enough. You know, I need to make uh, um, a hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred thousand. Why? Because you needed to 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 get your kids the college education they want. I mean, uh, a college is two hundred thousand dollars a year for a private education. I mean, it's expensive. You know, I want to give my family a better life. I want to give myself a better life. My my kids a better life. I want to. You know, if you want to take um, a family of four to Atlantis for 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 a week, it's eighteen thousand dollars. Well, so the point is, every every single person I've ever talked to, they says, you know what? I want to make worth it money. I want to because you're missing nights and weekends and major holidays. You have to work the day after Thanksgiving. You know, you have to work Martin Luther King Day. Well, that's because that's when people are buying. And so the biggest thing I, I talk to people about is, if you're not making worth it money, then you need to be obsessed over figuring it out. You need to be obsessed over figuring it out. You got to have that that fight in you that says, you know what? I, I'm not going to. Uh, to go to work and make fifty thousand dollars a year and, and and deal with the sacrifices, and so uh, the worth it number is a big thing in even our own family. So, like in my own family, I have a rule: I leave every Monday on the road and try. I got two kids, second grade, first grade, been married for thirteen years, and out of Dallas, Tech, Fort Worth, Texas, and I leave every Monday, get back every Wednesday night. Well, we just I wanted to do this big push into the banking industry, and so we started speaking to one hundred fifty different banks, and I spoke um, twelve times over like a six week period. Well, it required me. To, to leave on Sundays and get back on Thursdays because I had to keep my existing business and so I had to leave longer, right? And I remember one day when I went to my wife, she, um, she was kissing me out the door on a Sunday and she looks at me and she says, you better make it worth it. You better make it worth it. And it's just crazy because I knew in our family at that moment, you know, she, she, I, we, uh, she said, she's like, look, if you're gonna now be gone an extra two or three nights a week away from our family, you know, she's basically like a single mother right now, right? So if you're gonna do that, you better have some sort of financial return on making this thing worth it. Otherwise, it's, it's like, what's the point? You know, we're not doing this. And I look, I, I get it. And people are going, Jason, it sounds like your life's all about money. It's not. Look, money is a vehicle to improve your life and your family's life, that's it. So it's, it's, it's not about the money, it's about what you do with the money. You know, and what and what contribution you're going to give to society with the money, but that's the biggest thing I would be obsessed over is you've got to figure it out. You know, you've got to figure out why am I not making the worth of money, and and what can I do in order to improve that? And honestly, the simple answer is this, and that is you must find people that are um, that are out uh, performing you in the exact same circumstance, and you must submit your life to them. You must submit and say, you're doing something I'm not doing and I got to figure it out, which is something I've been doing since I was 22 years old. So my first job out of college, I got fired at Merrill Lynch and I didn't know what, I was working my tail off and I remember when I got fired two years into Big it. Big mistake, Merrill Lynch. Appreciate that. So when I got fired uh, uh, two years after it, uh, my, the branch manager comes to me, they, they had me training at Merrill Lynch, and, but I was working my tail off, making 100, 100 cold calls a day. And he says, look, I've never seen a guy work so hard and be so poor. He goes, if you can figure out you know, taking your work ethic and figure out a better way to do it, you'd be successful, right? And so from that day forward, I read this book, Think and Grow Rich, and just, and one of the concepts in the book was, you know, find the most successful person in the area that you want to be and just submit your life to them, you know, and just copy the heck out of them. 
And so, I mean, since then I did that. I mean, the first book I read in New Home Sales uh, was uh, a book was was you know Bob Schultz's New Home Sales Handbook. I went to dinner. I went to dinner with him last night, and I always tell the story because. I had this um, interview at Ryland Homes. This is this is really a cool, cool story because a lot of people, maybe you don't even have a career in new home sales yet, but you want to get in the business. And a lot of people tell me, they go, well, I can't get in because they all look for experience. I don't have any experience. How do I get in? And I said, well, let me tell you my story. So my story is really simple in the sense that that I I, um, I went into this interview with Ryland Homes and this guy named Joe Tinker was the sales co- sales manager. And I said, look, I know I don't have any experience in new home sales. However, I read this book. It's number one on Amazon. It's like 15 years ago. And I don't know if it's any good. However, it was number one and I've memorized everything in the book. It's highlighted, ask me anything you wanna know, okay? And so he starts asking me all this stuff. How do you, you know, uh, if a customer comes in and you know, how do you get them to stay with you longer and how do you overcome this objection, lot price, lot size, all this stuff, right? Five minute drills. I just started rattling this stuff off. And he said, you know more than 70% of my existing workforce, you never sold a house before. And I said, he said, now I don't know if you're gonna be able to execute, but at least you know more than everyone else. So he said, I'll really take a chance on you and see if you can execute what you actually know. And so it was just really interesting to me because, you know, the, the, the secrets of the whole thing are you have to be, you have to work like no one else so you can earn like no one else. But then you have to find really, really successful people and you have to just copy what they do. Fantastic. It's a, I know there's a lot of people that want to talk to you right now and you've got your big event coming up. Uh, Jason, it's a ple- pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Inspiring person. This is a guy that you want to watch. Keep your eye on him. Get his books. Hire him as a consultant. Uh, Jason Forrest. And again, this is Quint Lears with newhomesales.com.